Well, hey, folks. Thanks for joining me for another Sunday School lesson. Coming to you from Bible Studies for Life for January the 10th. And the title of the lesson is Weathering the Blues. Now, I was born and raised in the Mississippi Delta, the cradle of blues music. So I thought if we're going to do a Sunday school lesson entitled Weathering the Blues, we got to have a little bit of blues music to go along with it. Even a good man, even a good man can get the blues. making it up on the fly there, but little blues to start off a lesson from Psalm 31 on weathering the blues. We all get them from time to time. The blues, the blahs, the doldrums, whatever you want to call it, down in the dumps. Uh, it happens. It's not the same thing as clinical depression. Your Sunday school lesson, lesson goes a, a long way to point that out. There is something that sometimes things not firing right and, uh, and, and clinical depression that needs treatment by a professional is different from the things that maybe you or I feel that just get us down in the dump. We watched the news tonight and it was pretty doggone depressing. Between um, the attack on the Capitol day before yesterday and another impeachment of the president and all the mess that the country's in and um, hitting record highs of COVID deaths every day. Uh, I hear that we now have our own uh, highly contagious strain in America. Um, people unemployed because of COVID, you know, all of just the news was really depressing tonight. It can make you, those kind of things make you get down to dumps, make you just feel, yeah. And then you add to that the normal things of life, like, you know, dealing with raising kids or aging parents or maybe a job change or a job loss or um, health issues outside of COVID, just normal stuff. Um, it's easy to get down in the dumps. It's easy to find yourself in the blues. Somebody, ooh, I don't remember who, um, famous blues player said, the blues ain't nothing but a good man feeling bad. Well, sometimes that's where we are, good men and women feeling bad. But David, who wrote Psalm 31 and lots of other Psalms, he had some insight into the blues and he knew where to turn when he had them. And you can believe that he had them. So um, we're going to look at the first eight verses of Psalm 31 and kind of walk through them and just see and kind of a big picture idea, some things that we can do when we have the blues to get through them. Um, and I believe that God wants us to bring, wants to bring us through them, wants to live victoriously, wants to live, wants us to live triumphantly, and wants us to rise above all the things that would pull us down. So let's pray and we'll talk about it. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for being the God who pulls us out of the blues. I, I pray for anyone who's watching this today who may be in the blues for whatever reason. Lord, may they find hope and peace and contentment in you. Speak to us through your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's look at the text, Psalm 31. In you, O Lord... 
I have taken refuge, a Psalm of David. In you, O Lord, I have taken refuge. Let me never be ashamed. In your righteousness, deliver me. Incline your ear to me. Rescue me quickly. Be to me a rock of strength, a stronghold to save me. For you are my rock and my fortress. For your name's sake, you will lead me and guide me. You will pull me out of the net which they have secretly laid for me, for you are my strength. Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have ransomed me, O Lord, God of truth. I hate those who regard vain idols, but I trust in the Lord. I will rejoice and be glad in your loving kindness because you have seen my affliction. You have known the troubles of my soul and you have not given me over into the hand of the enemy. You have set my feet in a large place. All right. Well, let's walk through this a little bit and see what did David do when he had the blues? What can we do when we have the blues? Starts off in verse 31, in you, O Lord, I have taken refuge. When he says I have taken, I think what he's saying right there is I've already done this. I have already taken refuge in you. I've done it in the past. In fact, we know for a fact that when he was just a boy and David went and stood before Saul and they were having all those troubles with the Philistines and Goliath and all that, David stood before Saul and said, I'll deliver you from this Philistine because God has delivered me from the lion and the bear and he's delivered me then and he'll deliver me now from this Philistine. I'm not worried about him at all. You see, David had that personal relationship. We talked about it last week when we looked at Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. All right? Well, here's that personal aspect again. In you, O Lord, I have taken refuge. So that's where I think we need to start. If we're a Christian and we have the blues, we're down in the dumps, we gotta, we gotta remember the relationship that we have. That's the first thing I would say. Remember the relationship. Remember that you have placed your faith and trust in Jesus. And he said things like, I will never leave you. He said things like the comforter will come and the Holy Spirit and will be there. And so if you are in a relationship with Jesus Christ, you need to remember when you get in the blues and you get feeling down about things, that you're in that relationship with the creator of the universe, the God who spoke everything into existence. And you have a personal relationship with him. You have access to him and his strength is inside of you. He says, let me never be ashamed. In other words, Lord, because I'm taking refuge in you, I want to be held up by you. I don't want to have anything in my life to be ashamed of, of my conduct, of who I am, of my character, of who I've become. He said, Lord, keep working in me to lift me up. The last part of verse 31 says, in your righteousness, deliver me. I think what David's doing right there is he's calling God to make good on his promises. God's righteousness demands that God uphold what he says he's going to do. And I think David was just bringing that to his mind to say, I know that God in his righteousness is going to defend me because I have taken refuge in him. That's important. You got to take refuge in him. That's not just a one-time thing. That doesn't just happen when you put your faith and trust in Jesus. That is an ongoing day by day coming in and taking refuge in him. When it rains outside and you go inside, you go in every time it rains. You don't stand out in the rain and say, well, I took refuge from the storm one time. That's good enough. No, it starts raining, you go inside. Sometimes I like to stand in the rain, but that's a whole nother story. <clears throat> All right, verse two. Incline your ear to me, rescue me quickly. In other words, Lord, I want to know that you're hearing me. Listen, Lord, listen. If David says, incline your ear to me, you know what David is doing? David is praying. David is talking to God. One of the best things you can do 
is remember the power of prayer. And when you get down in the dumps and you get the blues and you get feeling like you've lost your last friend and everybody's against you and the whole world is falling apart, you need to get down on your knees and you need to talk to God. You need to cast your troubles at him. I love that verse that says, casting all your cares upon him because he cares for you. That is a beautiful piece of scripture. We need to go to God and be talking and be praying and be emptying our heart out before him. And when we get through with our little pity party with God, we need to start praising him and telling him how amazing he is and thank him for his blessing, reliving some of those blessings, thinking about the things that he has done for you. So when he, when he says, incline your ear to me, it indicates that he is praying to God. So we want to be doing the same thing. Now, he shows a little impatience here. Rescue me quickly. That is a natural thing for us to want to happen. But we got to realize that sometimes God wants to take us through some things in order for us to learn some things about ourselves, about him, about what he wants to do in our lives. And so we may be asking, Lord, get us out of this quickly. Maybe a better question to ask or a better thing to say is, Lord, show me what I need to see while we're going through this. Then he says, be to me a rock of strength, a stronghold to save me. In verse 3, those same ideas are going to come up uh, again. For you are my rock and my fortress. The fortress uh, refers back to the stronghold. The, the rock is mentioned there twice. So he's, in verse 3, he says, you are my rock. You are my fortress. In verse 2, he says, be to me that, that rock of strength and that stronghold to save me. So, so, what, so, so it's almost as if he's asking God to do this in verse 2, but then he's remembering in verse 3 and stating that I know you are those things. You know, sometimes we, sometimes I hear people, and I'm guilty of it too, praying, Lord, be with me. And every time I say that or I hear somebody say that, I think to myself, I don't have to ask that because I know that he is. I kind of see that in what David is doing right here. Uh, be to me a rock of strength, a stronghold to save me. And then it's like, but wait, I know you are my rock and my fortress. And so the imagery that David is using in this psalm, remember these oftentimes were songs and set to music. In fact, this one says for the choir director. So we know this was something that was to be a song. And so <clears throat> as, he, as he plays these, these words and these images against each other in the song, he is reminding himself as others who would sing it and us who would read it, that God is that solid rock upon which we stand. One of the things that puts us in the blues is um, the uncertainty of life. Maybe things are changing. Maybe the, we feel them changing and we don't know what's coming next. And that can be really unsettling and rattling. And yet, David says, even in these times, I know you are the rock that I can stand on that will not move. You know, you, you, if you're walking through mud, your feet are sliding and they're squishing and they're going here, but you step out onto a rock and all of a sudden it's solid and it gives you a foundation to stand on. David says, that's what I need. We need to recognize that God is that for us. And so when we're in those uncertain times, go to him and remember, we got we to gotta have that relationship and we got to stand in that relationship before him. Um, verse three, for you are my rock and my fortress. For your name's sake, you will lead me and guide me. Doesn't that take you back to Psalm 23? He lead me in the paths of righteousness for he leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Same ideas coming out of David right here. For your name's sake, you will lead me and guide me. He's guiding him and leading him for the sake of his own name. God it is I believe God does this with us, that he guides us and he leads us for his glory and for the uplifting of his name so that we bring glory to him. Now, it's our job to follow him as he guides us. But as he does, and so we can remember when we find ourselves in that low place in life, God is still wanting to lead us through it. 
And so our job is to follow. Verse four, you will pull me out of the net which they have secretly laid for me for you are my strength. So David here presents the imagery of a trap that his enemies have set against him. Uh, Satan would love to use the things that um, unravel your emotions and your psyche, would love to use those as a trap to hold you in the blues, to hold you in uh, despair and discouragement. And so we need to recognize that David's asking God to pull him out of that. What do we need to do? We need to ask God to pull us out of that. And recognize when we really get down and discouraged and feeling despair, that Satan is setting a trap for us in that to try to keep us there. But God will pull us out because he is our strength. That's the way David ends verse 4. For you are my strength. What is David not doing right here? He is not relying on his own strength. He's calling upon the strength of God. Listen, my strength fails. Your strength will fail. we got to rely on the strength of God. How do we do that? We find the strength of God pouring through our life as we spend time with him in the word, in prayer, focusing upon him, serving him, and looking to him and trusting him. We find his strength coursing through our lives. Verse 5, into your hand I commit my spirit. In other words, David says, look, Lord, I am putting myself, I'm putting everything that I am, my very spirit of my life, I'm putting it in your hands and trusting you. And then he says, you have ransomed me, O Lord, God of truth. David realizes what God has done for him. And if you have put your faith in Jesus Christ, then you need to understand what he has done for you. He has ransomed you out of the hands of the devil. And he has saved you and he has redeemed you. And you can every day put your life, your spirit in his hand and trust him because he has already paid the ultimate price for you. You understand how loved you are by God that he would send his son, God in human flesh, to die on a cross for you so that he could have that relationship with you forever and ever. Oh yes, he has ransomed you. And so you can trust him with your life. Verse six, I hate those who regard vain idols, but I trust in the Lord. Here's a mindset thing. Sometimes the things that get us down and make us feel discouraged are can be seeing the... Um, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, can seeing the success or the seeming happiness of those who have the things of the world and they have idolized those things of the world and, and, and by the measure of the world, they're just successful and doing great. And David says, but those who are serving other gods other than the God. And we say, well, wait a minute. Why? We see people around us that are like, they're not serving other gods. Yeah, they probably are. They're serving the gods of success. They're serving the gods of plenty. They're serving the gods of money. They're serving the gods of power and position. They are living for themselves. They're living for pleasure. All sorts of different things. Those are idols just as much as the statues that the pagans of that day would bow down to. And David says, I hate that, but I love you, Lord. I trust in you, Lord. David is making a very strong statement here in the midst of a culture all around him that worshiped everything other than God that he was just going to trust in God. Listen, folks, that is a word for us today because we live in a culture of people that are worshiping everything. There are idols all around us, but we've got to say, I will trust in God. Regardless of what anybody else does, I will trust in him. And then verse seven, he says, I will rejoice and be glad in your loving kindness because you have seen my affliction you have known 
the troubles of my soul, and you have not given me over into the hand of uh, the enemy. You have set my feet in a large place. David says, here, I got some reasons to rejoice. You know where I am. Let me tell you what, God knows where you are. He knows the things that are pulling you down right now, weighing you down. And if you're not right now, when you get there later on, which sooner or later we all do, he knows where you are. He knows what's going on. David, before he even said that, he said, I will rejoice and be glad in your loving kindness. He's remembering the blessings that God has poured out on him. We need to do that. We start feeling down and we start uh, looking at the, the downside of the everything, the half-empty glass and uh, thinking about, oh, this is bad and that's bad. Oh, poor me. And having ourselves a little pity party. We need to remember how God has blessed. We need to remember what he has done in the past and get our focus turned to something different than the things that are weighing us down right then. All right, so he's rejoicing because of what God has done. He's rejoicing because God has seen his affliction, knows where he is, knows what's going on, knows the troubles of my soul. He ends verse seven with, <coughs> God knows what's troubling your soul, folks. It still helps for you to talk to him about it. You're, you're not informing him of anything. He already knows, but it's good just to talk about it. Just to open it up to him and say, God, this is really weighing heavy on me. I, I'm hurting because of this. Whatever it is, take it to him in prayer. And this past Sunday, uh, we sang, what a friend we have in Jesus. Um, and, 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 and there's that line in there that says, um, oh, what, uh, oh, I can't do it unless I'm singing it. Oh, what, oh, what, uh, Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. That fits right into this lesson. Take it to him and let him lift those blues. Um, verse 8, you have not given me over into the hand of the enemy. Let me tell you what. God is not going to give you over into the hand of, of the enemy. Who is the enemy? The devil is. Satan is the one who wants to destroy your life. God has bought you out of his hand and is not going to turn you over to him. And he will hold you. And I love this last line. You have set my feet in a large place. That is a picture of blessing. God has blessed you. Oh, he may have brought you through some difficult things. You may be in some right now, but the blessings are coming. They are there. So when you get down in the dumps, when you get to feeling the blues, and like we sang just a minute ago, even a good man or a good woman can get the blues, but they know that Jesus will pull them through. Remember the relationship. Remember what his righteousness will do. Remember that he hears you. Remember that he is your rock and your strength. Remember that he will pull you out of those traps that the devil has set for you. Remember that you can trust him because he has ransomed your life. Turn your attitude, turn your attention, and focus on him and what he has done, and rejoice as you praise and as you worship the God who is all in all. I hope that that will help you sometime when you are weathering the blues. We all get there, but God can get us out. Every single one of us. Father, I thank you for the word. I thank you for what we see in David's heart right there. I thank you for what you want to do in our hearts. And I pray for anyone who's uh, dealing with the blues right now, Lord. Would you bring the sunshine into their life again. And let them know that they are extremely special in your eyes and safe in your hand. Thank you, Father, for your word. In Jesus' name. All right, that's going to do it for this lesson. If you have questions or comments or something I can pray about for you, just shoot me a text or an email. I'll be glad to respond to you and uh, pray with you, whatever it might be. Hope you have a great day. Uh, thank you for watching these lessons. Hey, listen, feel free to share these. Put a link, link to these if it 
mean something to you, put a link to it if you have Facebook or all those kinds of things. Just shoot a link to it, share it with somebody else. Be glad for you to do that. Um, all right, I'm fixing to get out of here. I may go play some more blues. All right, talk to you later. God bless you. Bye.